You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. Hey gang, good Thursday afternoon. Hope you're having a great day. My name is Clayton Bailey. Welcome into Packers Total Access. You can check us out on Packernet.com. You can find me on Twitter at Packers underscore access. Also, if you want to email the show, you can do so by sending a message to Packers Total Access at gmail.com. If you've got a question or a comment for the show, that's where you want to send that to. And I do want to say that today's show is brought to you by mercyandme.ca. Guys, if you're if you're looking for a gift to to get for uh, someone who's expecting a child or maybe they have a newborn, um, this is an awesome, awesome gift idea. And what's really cool is it's one of the listeners of the show. And it's uh, their family-owned business, and uh, basically they they create these uh, these homemade gifts. I know we actually made a purchase for a, a couple that we're good friends with here in Tennessee, and uh, they were expecting twins, and we got some really cool gifts uh, for the twins that uh, that they have now welcomed into the world. And and one one thing I will say is this has got to be the softest material you've ever felt. Is exactly what they said to us. You know, I'm a guy. And probably most mostly guys listen to this show right now, right? And uh, I didn't know what to get them, right? And my wife was saying, "Well, what what should we get Nathan and Amanda? You know, they got the twins that are going to be born here in a couple of weeks." And I was like, "I don't, know. you know what? I know a guy." And so we actually, uh, I sent my wife to the website. Like I said, it's uh, Mercy and Me dot ca and she got on there and just bought some awesome awesome gifts for not just them but a couple other people as well so you get a chance check that out if you want to support someone who supports the show i think that's always important now uh getting to today's show we've got a pretty cool one on tap you know i debated on what we were going to cover today and i finally just pulled the trigger and said you know what it's dead time let's talk about the ice bowl right and i know a lot of people uh most most people know what the ice bowl is um, there's probably some that are hearing my voice that are going, well, I've, I've vaguely heard of it. So hopefully you come away from today's episode with a better understanding of exactly how important the uh, the Ice Bowl was. And then on top of that, we're going to wrap up the show talking about a few Packers who made the PFF Top 50 that's being unveiled here this week. Uh, the whole Top 50 hasn't been completely unveiled, but there's been several players that's already landed on that list. So uh, before we get into the history segment, let's go ahead and talk about um, the Packers Rams Monday Night Football giveaway that we've got going on. Indoor club seat tickets for the Monday Night Football matchup at Lambeau Field on December 19th against the Rams. I actually got the tickets uh, sent over to me today and they're ready to be transferred. Um, We are drawing one winner. Um, and uh, for for an indoor club seat, five hundred and seventy five dollars in value, or I'm sorry, five hundred dollars in value, and also a VIP tailgate pass to D two Bar, just right down the uh, the street from Lambeau Field. Um, three hours before the game, all you can eat, all you can drink, uh, get in there, watch the a- late afternoon games before you head over to Lambeau and watch the game with us. Where, like I said, it's going to be a climate controlled area indoor club. And uh, you got access to the rooftop if you want to go up there and freeze your keister off, you know, take your shirt off, run around like a madman. That's cool, too. But we're going to be inside watching the game uh, in in a balming, uh, a balmy, I should say, 67 degrees. So uh, really, really excited about that. And if you want to enter that contest, all you got to do is go to my Twitter page at Packers underscore access, retweet the tweet that's pinned at the top of the page. Follow the account. That'll get you entered in. We're going to draw that here in the next few weeks. Um, some Sometime between August 5th and, and maybe August 15th is kind of the uh, the goal there. So with that being said, let's talk about the Ice Bowl. The Ice Bowl, of course, was the 1967 NFL championship, right? And uh, it was, uh, man, what, what an amazing, amazing story. I remember hearing about this game as a child. 
And uh, really, <clears throat> there's two things that come to mind. If you're a football nerd, you understand just how important that championship game was going into, um, you know, I believe it was the uh, the second Super Bowl that year. And obviously that would go, they would go on to win their third straight championship, which we talked about in the Curly Lambeau episode. That was something Lombardi really wanted that he could kind of put that on his resume along with uh, Curly Lambeau. I have a, a pretty good feeling and feel confident that that's why he wanted that on his resume. Right. So <laughs> um, I think that's a, a pretty cool aspect to the story in itself. And um, yeah, so let's do this. Let's kind of kick it off. Right. Let's play a quick sound bite here. And this comes from the uh, football life uh, Lombardi reigns episode. Uh, really? I'm sorry, not the Lombardi ep- uh, Lombardi reigns episode, but this is actually from the Packers legacy documentary. It's called Lombardi reigns, but check this out. All the uh, mud to it coagulated on the field, froze to the field. It was almost as if you had a stucco wall and you laid it down and then you had to play on that. The upper level was where the cameras were, so there couldn't be glass in front of the cameras. So for the entire game, we were literally outside. Every time a guy opened that damn door, it was like the Arctic Circle. Coffee froze on the ledge. Guys wiping the windows with the keeps or the breath through it. So you could see out the window. It was terrible conditions. The first play of the game was almost a disaster. Donnie Anderson fumbled. You know, it was like trying to hold an ice cube. The referee blew the whistle. He tried to pull the whistle, which was a metal whistle. It stuck to his lip, and he had to rip it out of his mouth. It cracked his lip, and the blood froze. And from that moment on, there was never another whistle in the ice bowl. Man, think about that. It was so cold. The ref blew the whistle. The whistle froze from the moisture in his mouth. The whistle completely froze to his lip. He had to pull the whistle off, pulling a piece of his skin off of his lip as well. Obviously, ripped his lip open, started to bleed, and the blood instantly froze. I mean, that's... (laughs) It's pretty cold, guys. (laughs) So let's do it. Let's get into it. The 1967 NFL championship game was the 35th NFL championship played on December 31st at Lambeau Field in Green Bay, Wisconsin. It determined the NFL's champion, which met the AFL's champion in Super Bowl II, then formally referred to as the second AFL NFL World Championship game. The Dallas Cowboys were nine and five champions of the Eastern Conference, traveled north to meet the Western champion Green Bay Packers, who were 9-4-1, the two-time defending league champions. It was a rematch uh, of the previous year's title game and pitted two future Hall of Fame head coaches against each other, Tom Landry for the Dallas Cowboys and Vince Lombardi for the Green Bay Packers. The two head coaches had a long history together as both had coached together on the staff of the late 1950s New York Giants, with Lombardi serving as offensive coordinator and Landry as defensive coordinator. Uh, Because of the adverse conditions in which the game was played, the rivalry between the two teams and the game's uh, dramatic climax, it's been immortalized as the Ice Bowl and is considered one of the greatest games in NFL history. NFL 100 Greatest Games ranked this game as the third greatest of all time and is still the coldest game ever played in NFL history. Leading up to the 50th anniversary of the game, NFL Films released an episode of the Timeline series about the event that day and the lasting impact. The episode is narrated and co-produced by film filmmaker Michael Meredith, whose father, Don Meredith, was a quarterback for the Cowboys that day. And I, I want to go back to what we talked about with Vince Lombardi and Tom Landry. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm trying a new program here. I'm going to attempt to get all the way through this podcast without having to edit anything. So wish me luck. I, I don't see it happening, but we're going to give it the old college try. But those two guys coached together in New York. Tom Landry was – Arguably, you know, he's considered the the greatest defensive minded coach. He actually invented the four three defense. You know, back then it was regular to have you know five and six uh, defensive linemen at the line of scrimmage with only two linebackers roaming in the middle. And what Landry uh, decided to do with the with the pass starting to kind of pick up in the league at that time, he said, "Let's you know let's do four down linemen and three linebackers," and it revolutionized the way people looked at the defensive side of the ball in the National Football League. 
So Vince Lombardi obviously was the offensive coordinator for the New York Giants, and his approach was real simple, a minute amount of plays, right? So not these, all these, you know, a huge playbook full of plays. He said, we're just going to run six, 10, maybe 12 plays, but we're going to perfect them. You're going to know exactly what we're doing. Try and stop us. That was basically their approach. So um, what's cool is the route to this NFL championship game. Um, it, a- it actually, the year before, um, there was a playoff game that they uh, they actually faced each other with the uh, with the Packers and the Cowboys, and um, it's uh, you know that that kind of added to the buildup of the game. It says the 1967 game <coughs> was a rematch of the previous seasons played in Dallas on January 1st, 1967. Um, more than two years after football had become the most popular televised sport in the nation, the game featured a matchup that all of America hoped for in the NFL championship. Landry's and Lombardi's paths crossed in 1954 with the New York Giants when Lombardi became the offensive coordinator and Landry left uh, the left cornerback for the Giants, took on the added role of defensive coordinator. Landry was the best defensive mind of his era and Lombardi was the best offensive coach of his era. It said, um, yeah, so as we go on to the weather, let's move on to that. The game became known as the Ice Bowl because of the brutally cold conditions. The game time temperature at Lambeau Field was about negative 15 degrees with an average wind chill around negative 48 degrees. Negative 48 degrees wind chill. That's just insane. Under the revised National Weather Service wind chill index implemented in 2001, the average wind chill would have been negative 36 degrees Fahrenheit. Lambeau Field's turf heating system malfunctioned. And when the tarpaulin was removed from the field before the game, it left moisture on the field. The field began to freeze gradually in the extreme cold, leaving an icy surface that became worse. Uh, More and more on the field fell into the shadow of the stadium. The heating system made by General Electric cost $80,000 and was bought from the nephew of George Hallis. That's right. Papa Bear Hallis's nephew actually sold that heating grid uh, unit to Lombardi. That's a pretty cool little side note. On the sidelines before the game, some Dallas players believed that Lombardi had purposely removed uh, power to the heating coils. The heating system would eventually be given the moniker Lombardi's Folly. The uh, prior convention to prevent football field from icing up was to cover the field with dozens of tons of hay. If you guys have seen the old pictures and the old NFL films videos where they had hay on the field and they had to rake the hay off, they did that in the past to keep the field from freezing. Um, the Wisconsin State University lacrosse, now the University of Wisconsin lacrosse, marching, Chief, marching Chiefs band was scheduled to perform the game, the pregame and halftime shows. However, during warm-ups in the brutally cold the woodwind instruments froze and would not play. The mouthpieces of brass instruments got stuck to the players' lips, and seven members of the band were transported to local hosp- uh, hospitals for hypothermia. The band's further performance was canceled for the day. Packers linebacker Dave Robinson recalled the field did not get really bad until the second half, saying that since the halftime show was canceled, there was no traffic on the field for an extended period of time to keep the surface crust broken up. During the game, an elderly spectator in the stands died from exposure. Prior to the game, many of the Green Bay Packers were unable to start their cars in the freezing weather, forcing them to make alternative um, alternate travel arrangements to make it to the stadium on time. Linebacker Dave Robinson had to flag down a random passing motorist for a ride. The officials for the game found they did not have significant sufficient clothing for the code and had to make an early trip to a sporting goods store for earmuffs, heavy gloves, and thermal underwear. Packers quarterback Bart Starr attended an early church service with his father who had visited for the game. And as Starr later said, quote, it was so cold that neither of us talked about it. Nobody wanted to bring it up. The officials were unable to use their whistles after the opening kickoff as referee Norm Schachter blew his metal whistle to signal the start of the play. It froze to his lips as he attempted to free the whistle from his lips. The skin ripped off and his lips began to bleed. The the conditions were so hostile that instead of forming a scab, the the blood simply froze to his lip for the rest of the game. The officials used commands and calls to end plays 
and officiate the game. Nothing was immune from the code. At one point during the game, CBS commentator Frank Gifford remarked, quote, I'm going to take a bite of coffee. It is too, as it had two frozen in the mug. So the media, the game was televised by CBS with play-by-play being done by Ray Scott in the first half and Jack Buck for the second half. You guys know Joe Buck, the, the uh, you know, famous, uh, you know, uh, commentator, I guess you could say, for Fox for so many years, going to be calling Monday Night Football this year. Everybody likes to act like he doesn't know what he's doing. That was his dad, Jack Buck, one of the greatest announcers in the history of sports. It says, while Frank Gifford handled the color commentary for the entire game, Pat Summerall, and Tom Brookshire served as sideline reporter. So there you see Pat Summerall was a sideline reporter. This was well before he took over and began calling games and then later on went to call games with John Madden and all that. Uh, Gifford and Summerall were uh, intimately aware of the personality differences that existed between Landry and Lombardi because they had both played on the New York Giants uh, during Landry and Lombardi's tenure at the Giants. Over 30 million people would tune in to watch the game. So think about that. Both of those players actually played for Lombardi and Landry, and they were the sideline reporters. That's a really, really cool nugget I didn't know. No copy of the complete telecast is known to exist. Some excerpts, such as the announcer's pregame comments on the field, were saved and are occasionally re-aired in retrospective features. The Cowboys radio broadcast on KLIF, with Bill Mercer announcing and the Packers radio broadcast on WTMJ with Ted Moore announcing still exists. So here's the game summary. Okay. Let's just kind of give you an idea of what happened um, during the game. It says kickoff was shortly after 1 PM central time. The Packers took a quick 14 to nothing lead with two after two touchdown passes from Bart Starr to Boyd Dowler on their first three possessions of the game. And Bart Starr was just so clutch in big games. That's amazing. However, despite gaining only two first downs on the first half. Dallas scored twice off uh, Green Bay fumbles late in the half uh, to cut the Packers' lead to 14-10. The Cowboys then started the second half with a long drive into Green Bay territory but lost the ball to a fumble. Uh, They would, however, take the lead 17-14 to on a 50-yard halfback option pass by Dan Reeves. You guys know Dan Reeves just recently passed away. You may have known him as the uh, head coach for the Atlanta Falcons or even further back. I think he coached the Denver Broncos for a bit. Um, he actually threw a, a option halfback option pass in the ice bowl for a touchdown. He was the starting halfback for uh, Landry's Cowboys. It says on the first play of the fourth quarter, after missing a potential game tying field goal, Green Bay scored the game winning touchdown at, on its uh, subsequent drive, regaining the lead 21 to 17 with only 13 seconds remaining. <clears throat> All right. So let's do this. Let's go straight to the drive. Let's talk about the drive. And this is, uh, Definitely the climactic uh, part of the ice bowl. Um, as you guys know, um, it was just such a gutsy call, and it's been so muddied over the years as to how it exactly happened. Um, I'm going to play a sound bite here in a second to kind of clear it up, but it says, in their last offensive drive, the Packers took possession – at their own 32-yard line with four minutes and 50 seconds left in regulation time. With the wind chill around, listen to this, with the wind chill around negative 70 degrees Fahrenheit, according to the revised formula, Starr led his team down the field towards the south end zone. He began the drive with a double fake to his backs, but after after no one was open downfield, he flipped a safety valve pass to running back Donnie Anderson, who gained six yards. Fullback Chuck Mercine then picked up seven on a sweep around right end and went out of bounds to stop the clock. Starr dropped, uh, dropped straight back on first down and fired a 13-yard pass to Dowler over the middle. Negative 70 degrees windshield, and Bart Starr out there winging that ice cube around. That's just amazing. Cornell Green's uh, tackle slammed the receiver's helmet off the icy turf, and Max McGee replaced Dowler. There's another – an instance where Max McGee comes in and saves the day, right? Dallas in Willie Towns broke through and smothered Anderson for a nine-yard loss on what's supposed to be a halfback option play. Anderson had told Starr on the sideline that he could pick up eight to ten yards on dump passes since the Dallas linebackers were laying back. Starr used this tip uh, to complete the two passes to Anderson for 12 and nine yards, gaining the key first down on the Dallas 30. Anderson juke linebacker Chuck Howley on both plays and ran by him as Howley uh, sprawled on the icy turf. 
Mersin towed Starr. Uh, he was also open on the left, and Starr flipped him a pass that the fullback carried down to the Cowboys' 11-yard line and out of bounds with 111 to play. I want to talk about this for a second. In a day where you see constantly receivers saying, just get me the ball, Keyshawn Johnson, just get me the D ball, right, all this stuff, Antonio Brown, all these divas. Here you had multiple occasions where these players, you know, whether it was Donnie Anderson or Chuck Mercine, and that's another thing that you want to realize here, guys, like notice you don't hear Jim Taylor and Paul Horning. This was very important for Lombardi's legacy because that Hall of Fame backfield was now gone. And they they drafted Donnie Anderson along with a, another rookie back, but they went out and signed Chuck Mercin right before this game. I can't remember if it was, uh, you know, exactly right before the game or if maybe he had come in a couple games earlier, but he was a free agent on the street and got Chuck Mercin in. And Chuck Mercin comes in and plays a huge role in this win right here for the Packers. But I just think it's so notable that, Multiple players tell him, Bart, you can just imagine they're in the huddle and he's like, hey, yeah, yeah, I, I, I can sneak out to the left. You can hit me in the flat here. The linebackers are struggling. You know, Donnie Anderson doing the same thing. It was just a real team. And it wasn't, give me the ball. I can get open. You know, I don't know. I just love that stuff. Uh, then Star called a play. He had uh, kept ready for the right situation. 54 give, a play that Lombardi frankly called the, quote, sucker play in the Packer playbook. Left guard, Gail Gillingham, pulled to his right like it was a typical sweep. And Cowboy right tackle uh, Bob Lilly, with his great reflexes, instantly followed him. The Packers left tackle Bob Skaronsky blocked Cowboy in. George Andre and Mercine shot through the hole to the three-yard line. So a little trickery there. Anderson carried on the next play to the one-yard line for a first down. Some Cowboys thought Anderson scored on the play, but the officials missed it. I didn't know that. Twice Anderson attempted to run the ball into the end zone, and both times he slipped on the icy field before taking the handoff, and he was tackled at the one-yard line. Uh, The second time, he almost fell down before Starr gave him the ball. By then, the thermometer read negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit, and the Packers called their last time out. With the low winter sun angle and the shade of the stands, the south end of the field had received a minimal amount of sunlight. The game had started off shortly, after 1 p.m. Central Time, and it was nearing sunset. So it just so happens they're in the shady part of the stadium where there's extra ice, and then this happens. On third and goal at the Dallas two-foot line with 16 seconds remaining, Starr went to the sidelines to confer with Lombardi. Starr had asked right guard Jerry Kramer whether he could get enough traction on the icy turf for a wedge play, and Kramer responded with an unequivalent yes – Summerall told the rest of CBS crew to get ready for a rollout pass because without any timeouts remaining, a failed run play would end the game. Landry would say he expected a rollout pass attempt because an incompletion would stop the clock and allow the Packers one more play on fourth down. Boy, this sounds a lot like the Russell Wilson Super Bowl play. The exact reason that the Seattle Seahawks, and if you've ever read Take Your Eye Off the Ball by Pat Kerwin, he talks about this. The only reason they threw in that situation was because they didn't have any timeouts and they knew that if they threw the ball, or maybe they have one timeout, if they threw at least one time, that would maximize the opportunities they had to score. So in this situation, everybody's looking for uh, Bart Starr and the Packers and Lombardi to do that um because they said um it said either for a touchdown to win or a field goal attempt to tie and send the game to overtime if the clock's running they can't do that but green bay's pass protection on the slick field had been rec- had been seriously uh tested during the game the cowboys had sacked star eight times eight sacks that bart star took that game on the sidelines according to star he told lombardi and i'm going to play a little video for you here a little audio clip and then we'll come back to this you go down easy so he can get all the It's a give and take. I'm not the, I'm not the complete autocrat here, do you see? Uh, as everybody thinks. <laughs> the Packers had identified their target, but the real enemy was the ice. So we call the play twice. The backs were slipping and sliding and couldn't get back to the line of scrimmage. The handoff goes to Donnie Anderson. He's not in. The Packers call time again. And then we take our final time out, and Bart asked me if I could make a block. Can you get your footing for one more wedge play? Yeah, I, 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 can, I think so. 
ran to the sideline, got over there, and I said, Coach, there's nothing wrong with the play. I said, the backs simply can't get to the line of scrimmage because the ground is so hard there. I said, I'm standing upright. I can shuffle my feet and lunge in. All he said at that time was, well, then run it, and let's get the hell out of here. (laughs) And I'm laughing like I am now, going back to the huddle. And I'm trying to not let anybody see me laughing because it just broke me up. That was his response. (laughs) That's all the timeouts the Green Bay Packers have. They are still inches away from that goal line. On third down with 16 seconds to go, Lombardi gambled everything on one last play. Landry would have called a rollout, and a lot of people would have called a rollout. Watch that star now, come on. Grant him if he fakes it. Lombardi wanted to run the wedge play. If you can't gain a yard, you don't deserve to be champions. Here are the Packers, third down, inches to go. The Bader. perspective on the last drive in the ice ball is that that is the culmination of everything Lombardi and his Packers had been preparing for, for all of those nine years together. All right, man, I could go on and on playing that. And you guys know that's the intro to Packers Total Access, right, is the ice ball quarterback sneak. Um, Just an amazing, amazing play, putting it all on the line. Um, so again, I'm going to go back to the article here real quick and we'll wrap this thing up. It says on the sidelines, according to story, told Lombardi coach, the lineman can get their footing for a wedge play, but the backs are slipping. I'm right there. I can just shuffle my feet and lunge it in. Lombardi told star quote, then run it and let's get the hell out of here. Lombardi was asked by Pat Pepler, what play star would call to which Lombardi replied, <laughs> quote, damn, if I know star returned to the huddle and caught a brown right 31 wedge. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Uh, he did, I don't know. I mean, it's just amazing how, you know, back then the quarterbacks called the game and just a different time. Play was a short yardage play used uh, with using a double team block to force an opening for the fullback. Starr made the play call in the huddle, but did not tell his teammates he was keeping the ball. Kramer and center Ken Bowman executed a post-drive block double team on left defensive tackle Jethro Pugh and star lunged across the goal line for a 20 to 17 lead. So aftermath, man, this is, I know this is a long history segment, but I think it's worth it. Um, aftermath, emotionally, both the Packers and the Cowboys players were spent in the Pack- Packers locker room. The players openly wept. They cried. Kramer told interviewers um, many things have been said about coach Lombardi. And he is not always understood by those who quote him. The players understand. This is one beautiful man. Packers linebacker Ray Nitschke developed frostbite in his feet, causing his toenails to fall off and his toes to turn purple. Bart Starr had frostbite on his fingers, and several Packer players were suffering from flu-like symptoms. Cowboys uh, George Andre, um, Willie Towns, and Dick Daniels also suffered frostbite during the game. The furthest thing from Star's mind was the thought of playing in the AFL-NFL World Championship game. To him, this was the Packers' championship game. Green Bay went on to finish the postseason by easily defeating the American Football League champion Oakland Raiders 33-14 to in the second AFL-NFL World Championship game. Brookshire and other uh, journalists went, went into the winning locker room for the post-game interviews, at some point, journalists had become aware of significance of the block Kramer and Bowman had placed on Pew. On 11 cameras, Ed and Steve Sable set up to film the game. God, Ed and Steve Sable, man, are so so vital to the history of the National Football League. If you don't know who those guys are, please go Google it. But it said Ed and Steve Sable uh, had set up to film, the, uh, to film the game. The pivot and motion capabilities of camera five had become frozen by the time Star's sneak occurred. The particular camera, however, was fortuitously positioned to offer a perfect view of the block. CBS had been replaying the block repeatedly and had been given the TV audience a detailed perspective of the workings of the offensive and defensive line. 
Frank Gifford recounted in his 1993 autobiography, The Whole Ten Yards, that he requested and received permission from CBS producers to go into the losing locker room for on-air post-game interviews, a practice unheard of in that era. Gifford, as a New York Giants player and a broadcaster, already enjoyed a friendship with Meredith, and he approached the quarterback for his thoughts on the game. The exhausted Meredith, in an emotion-choked voice, expressed pride in his teammates' play and said in a uh, figurative sense that he felt the Cowboys did not really lose the game because the effort expanded uh, expanded was its own reward. Uh, Gifford wrote that the interview attracted considerable attention and that Meredith's forthcoming and introspective response played a part in the selection of ABC's Monday Night Football telecast three years later. Defensive tackle Bob Lilly took a different view, telling reporters that the Cowboys were a great team, except that they could not win the big one. Wide receiver Lance Rensel um, later remarked, that on the team plane home from Green Bay to Dallas Love Field, quote, not one word was spoken the entire flight. I mean, if Tom Landry wins that game, if Bart Starr does not, you know, decide to keep it himself and he, you know, didn't even tell his teammates, according to this report, there's other reports that say that Kramer knew. And if you, if you ever read the book Instant Replay, you would kind of see that was something that was mentioned there. And, um, yeah, it's just uh, – I don't know, man. It's just what what would, you know, would it be Tom Landry on that award now, on that trophy to the Super Bowl winner, right? I mean, it's amazing stuff. So um, good stuff. All right, well, we're well, well beyond when we should have taken a break. So we're going to go ahead and do that right now. Let's take a quick break, pay some bills. And uh, after this commercial break, we'll get back and and talk about an article. Uh, just to, just want to highlight a few players, and then we'll get you guys out of here. So that was the Ice Bowl. Hope you enjoyed it. Let's take a quick break. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. It's only a kick. A jump. A block. It's only a serve. It's only a tackle. A run. It's only for the fans. After all, it's only pressure. You got this. Adidas. This episode is brought to you by Hyperice, the leader in advanced warm-up and recovery technology. They have tons of innovative products, like Venom heated wearables to help soothe sore back muscles, Normatec compression boots to speed up recovery and increase circulation, and Hypervolt massage guns to improve mobility. Loved by athletes like Naomi Osaka and Erling Holland. Try them yourself. Get 10% off your order with the code MOVE at hyperice.com. Introducing Royal Caribbean's newest ship, Icon of the Seas, the ultimate family vacation. The ultimate six slides, eight neighborhoods, zero compromise vacation. The ultimate never done that, can't wait to do it vacation. The ultimate chillin' by a different pool every day of the week vacation. This is the Icon of Vacations. Icon of the Seas, arriving in 2024. Book today. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry Bahamas. All right, so here we go. Um, the PFF Top 50 is uh, actually, um, you know, Top 50 of 2022 has uh, began to unroll, right? They've been releasing it this week. And I'll just read the article here real quick, the, the title, and then we'll talk about the Packers players that made it and any N- NFC North players that might have made it. It says, as the, as the 2022 NFL season draws near, the prospect of seeing the best players of football take the field once more is getting even closer. Um, ever closer. PFF is at its heart a player evaluation company quantifying hundreds of data points on any given play in an effort to identify the best players and use the information to create useful insights across the spectrum of football analysis. This is a list of the best 50 players in the NFL entering the 2022 season. No single number or grade dictates this list, 
but the grading along with the PFF wins above replacement, which you guys uh, have heard Ryan talk about as their war rating metric, has been used as a foundation while waiting towards the uh, the most recent season. And it says, editors note, and this is important, the PFF 50 will be unveiled in reverse order starting on Monday, July 18th. The 10 best players in the NFL will be named on Friday, July 22nd. Check back through the week and uh, and see where the top 50 players in the league uh, heading into the season. Now, we're all the way up to uh, through 21. So this is 50 through 21 is what we're reading here. OK, so let's go ahead and start at 50 and I'm going to read them off real quick. And it's got a little uh, a little piece on you know, on every player. I'm not going to read all of those, but I am going to read it for the Green Bay Packers. Okay, it says edge defender Max Crosby comes in at number 50. Number 49, edge defender Rashawn Gary for the Green Bay Packers. It says Gary was a raw prospect who had immense physical tools when the Packers drafted him in the first round. And last year, he realized all that potential in a major way. He recorded a 90.1 PFF pass rushing grade while racking up 81 pressures over the course of the season and improving as the year went on. He could be even better in 2022. All right, number 48, you got Xavier Howard, cornerback from Miami. Number 47, Khalil Mack of the Los Angeles Chargers. Number 46, edge defender Cameron Jordan of the Saints. Number 45, safety Marcus Williams of the Ravens. Number 44, running back Nick Chubb of the Browns. Number 43, linebacker Darius Leonard of the Indianapolis Colts. Number 42, wide receiver Jamar Chase of the Bengals. Number 41, Tyron, Tyron Smith of the Dallas Cowboys, an offensive tackle. Then at number 40, we have our very own safety, Adrian Amos, Green Bay Packers. It says Amos is one of the most underrated players in the game and has a real argument uh, to be seen as the league's best safety, or at least at the very least, one of the best. He has never been a, had a bad season in the NFL, recording seven pass breakups, along with three interceptions this past year. He has missed fewer than 10% of the tackle attempts in each of his past three campaigns. I mean, that's he obviously played a huge role in the Packers having a great tackle grade there uh, last year. So um, number 39, you got Stephon Diggs, wide receiver for the Buffalo Bills. Number 38, you got Tristan Wurst of the uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, offensive lineman. You've got uh, number 37, I believe, yeah, I believe it was right, right tackle, yeah. Number 37, you got running back Dalvin Cook of the Minnesota Vikings. Um, Let's read his real quick since that is a Vikings player. Cook hasn't had as good of a blocking in front of him as some other elite running backs, but his ability to make something out of nothing shows up time and time again uh, for the Vikings. He has averaged three yards after contact for his career while posting double-digit breakaway runs of 15 or more yards in each of the past three seasons. So I had to admit, man, Dalvin Cook's a solid back. It's just he can't stay healthy. You know, I mean, if, if, if you would tell me, yeah, they're, they're going to get the health thing taken care of, I'd be a lot more worried about him. But it just seems like he's always getting hurt. Number 36, defensive lineman Vita Vea from Tampa Bay Buccaneers. 35, safety Kevin, uh, Kevin Byard from the Titans. 34, wide receiver A.J. Brown from the Eagles. Number 33, center Corey Lindsley from the Los Angeles Chargers. You guys know we hate to see Corey Lindsley go, but he's still doing the thing out there. Uh, number 32, quarterback Justin Herbert of the Los Angeles Chargers. Number 31, wide receiver DeAndre Hopkins of the Arizona Cardinals. Number 30, Fred Warner of the San Francisco 49ers. Number 29, Micah Parsons of the Dallas Cowboys. Number 28, Debo Samuel of the San Francisco 49ers. Number 27, Joe Burrow of the Bengals. Number 26, Nick Bosa of the 49ers. Number 25, Joey Bosa of the Chargers. A little bit of bragging rights there on, uh, on little brother. Uh, number 24, uh, Tyreek Hill from the Miami Dolphins. Number 23, Green Bay Packers offensive tackle, David Bakhtiari. Said so another Packers player who missed almost, almost all of 2021. Bakhtiari played just 27 snaps in the regular season in an effort to get back uh, for Green Bay uh, Green Bay's playoff run. Previ- previously, when he he's been full healthy, Bakhtiari was the best pass-blocking tackle in the entire league, allowing nine pressures across 446 passing block snaps, uh, pass blocking snaps of 2020, a healthy Bakhtiari should still be an elite force in 2022. Let's hope he's healthy, man. So right above him, number 22, cornerback for the Green Bay Packers, Jair Alexander. Alexander missed most of the entire 2021 season with an injury, forcing Green Bay to lean on rookie Eric Stokes and Rasul Douglas. 
However, we're a year removed from seeing him play as well as any cornerback in the game. He earned a 90.6 PFF coverage grade and notched 13 pass breakups while allowing 50.7% of passes thrown his way to be caught in his uh, last full season. So another key stat here is his highest graded cornerbacks in coverage since 2020. Jair Alexander is at the top at 90.8. Just behind him is Jalen Ramsey at 90 and Xavier Howard at 86.3. Coming in at number 21 is running back Jonathan Taylor. So, again, we just have 50 through 21. And in that short list, we have, what, one, two. Let's count them off here real quick. There's two Packers. There is three Packers. Yeah, so we have four Packers show up in the top 50, just from 50 to 20. Uh, Pretty impressive, man. Pretty pretty darn impressive. And – yeah, and the fact that, the, you know, I think three of the four were actually uh, defenders says a lot about that defense and the step they're going to take forward this year. So I'm excited. I, I can't wait for the rest of this list to drop. I thought it would just be cool to touch on that real quick. Again, the majority of this episode was strictly to uh, to get you guys the ice bowl, and I, I thought we'd just go ahead and unveil that and have some fun doing it. Hopefully this new format uh, flowed okay. Again, usually I can edit, I can pause, I can stop during the show, and um, – when using this, I have to kind of go through continuously. I'm sure I could find an easy editor, but I want this to be as organic as possible. That was really the goal of doing this. So hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, like I said, your history segment, the Ice Bowl, get on a little bit of PFF numbers for the Packers. Guys, we got some huge dates coming up. I mean, on the 22nd, that's this Friday, the Packers rookies report to camp this Friday. And then next Monday is the shareholders meeting along with on Tuesday, the Packers veterans will report, and then lo and behold, 27th of July, Packers training camp opens. Guys, it's here. Football season's here. We made it. So appreciate you guys listening. As always, thank you for taking the time to uh, to hang out with us. We don't take it lightly. We really, really appreciate it. Let's go out and be the change we want to see in the world. And uh, as always, you know the drill. Go Pack Go. Third passage is to go. The Vader, 17 to 14.